This is the Wealth Ability for CPAs show. Better clients, better practice, better life. Here's Tom Wheelwright. So what's the most dangerous aspect of your practice right now? Is it not getting enough clients? Is it not having cash flow? Is it new tax laws? I don't think so. I think today our most, the biggest danger we have is cybersecurity. And we've seen it with the IRS um, and their lack of cybersecurity. We've seen it with other um, government agencies, but we've also seen it with big companies. So today we're going to discover how to protect our clients, ourselves, and our practices from cyber threats. And we have two experts in this field, uh, Derek Reveron and John Savage, who um, are uh, written a book called Security in the Cyber Age. And it's an introduction to policy and technology. And I love the introduction because a lot of us are, um, are a little older and uh, need that, need, need those basics. So we're going to get some really practical information. Um, but first of all, uh, Derek and John, if you would just uh, give us a little bit of your background and how you guys came together. Great. I'll, I'll start. So, Tom, thanks for having us on the show and uh, I agree with your intro. It's a very dangerous world on a lot of levels. Uh, but uh, I am currently a professor and chair of national security at the U.S. Naval War College. And we're a graduate institution uh, for military officers from the United States, all services and around the world. And of course, these are my personal views. I don't represent the Department of Defense, Department of Navy or the Naval War College. Um, we developed the book and we very much came together because uh, our current Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, when she was governor of Rhode Island, established the first cybersecurity commission in the country about 10 years ago to wrestle with this issue. And that's how John and I met. Uh, interesting. So John, give us a little of your background. I'm a computer scientist. Uh, I am one of the founders of the CS department of Brown University and was its uh, second chair. And I have done research in a <clears throat> large variety of areas. Um, when I heard about the Jefferson Science Fellowship Program at the State Department designed to bring in to the State Department people who are not normally hired, but are needed to help with understanding technologies, I applied and I spent a year in the State Department Cyber Affairs Office, where I was introduced to cybersecurity, a topic I had never done research on before. And when I got back to Brown, I decided I was going to teach in this area and do research and complete my education. And it's a, as a consequence of that that Derek and I met through the governor's uh, cybersecurity commission. Awesome. So um, so as, as accountants, uh, we, we talk a lot about having, um, you know, protections uh, against theft and um, mistakes. And basically, you know, the general rule is you somebody has to have motive and opportunity. And uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll talk about, about the opportunity because we can't control motive. And that's the one thing that we've, we've all learned in our practices. Uh, we've all had clients who had theft and they had, they have theft typically from a bookkeeper or partner or somebody like that, but cybersecurity adds a whole new level to it. And it seems to me like there's two different levels. One is the technology level and we'll get to that, but I want to start with the people side of it because that, I think that's a really underestimated part of cybersecurity. And, and if we can, let's start with something that's recently been in the news in our world, which is the lack of security among certain independent contractors at the IRS. So, so here's my first question. How does an independent contractor walk out with 3,000 tax returns from the IRS? What, what protections were they missing from a, from a, a people standpoint? Let no, me it's a great question. back at that. Uh, when I was first introduced to cybersecurity, I met someone who had done some work for the federal government. And I said uh, to this person, uh, asked him if he'd give me some tips on what he was able to do. And he said, well, you know, uh, if a person is reading a classified document and uh, you're using, let's say, Microsoft Word, and you uh, were able to monitor this person's actions, and you found that this person removed the header and the footer, which would carry the 
the uh, the Appalachian top secret secret, and then executed a print. You might then say that person is in the process of trying to steal a classified document, so you should flag that and stop that person before they leave the office. <laughs> Something like that. So human behavior is the root of all of this, and I think one can assess what kind of malicious activities an individual could be engaged in if you were developing tools to protect your, say, IRS information. Uh, and you have to take these uh, issues seriously. I think uh, for the longest while, people have been told cybersecurity is an issue, it's an issue, it's an issue. Here are some steps you can take, and they haven't done it. Rob Joyce, who uh, spent his career at, primarily at the National Security Agency, has talked publicly about steps you can take to protect yourself. And he points out that periodically, uh, NSA is asked to investigate uh, websites maintained by the various uh, federal agencies. They'll discover flaws that need to be remediated. They'll report them to that agency, and they'll come back a year or two later, and they're still there. So if you ignore security practices, if you don't listen to the people who really understand these things, you're, you are going to, going to be at risk. So, so Derek, let me ask you this. So it took almost, it took two years, over two years for them to discover who yeah. was the culprit at the IRS. And, uh, and, and then basically got a slap on the wrist. I mean, he got five years, um, but nothing happened to the IRS commissioner. He wasn't even criticized over it. So uh, why, why, what, 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 because what I'm kind of get, trying to get at, Derek, is, you know, the things that we can do in our offices, right, in our companies, what can we do so that we don't have this type of thing happen and we, we find it a lot faster than two years down the road? Yeah, so unfortunately, two, two years is, is too normal um, in, in sort of the breach detection world. It's it's. Mm -hmm. that attackers, uh, and there was even a bigger case, not to, to pull away from the IRS for a second, but there was this bigger case, you might have heard of this last week, where you had the FBI director talk about Chinese infiltration of water treatment plants, power plants. They were on the systems for five years before they were discovered. Wow. Breach detection is a really hard problem. And, and if I could cut off for the metaphor a little bit to kind of get us back to kind of the main question, I think fundamentally how we often think about security, if you think about your house, um, you know, you might live in a neighborhood that has, you know, security. Uh, your houses probably have doors and you have locks. It's very much a perimeter security idea. Uh, but once you're in your house, you feel generally safe. Um, the problem with or the challenge for cybersecurity is Perimeter security is a very small part, that the real weak link in cybersecurity is people. It's the individuals. And so we dedicate a whole chapter to the human dimension of cybersecurity in the book. Um, and, and so the ways to sort of protect it, I don't know, you know, once the information goes to another entity outside of your organizations, it's up to them to protect, you know, what you can do. And, and then with the federal government, probably, probably not much. Um, you know, but what I would say, um, you know, is think about, you know, how you're training your employees, what your security looks like with your data, uh, because you're fundamentally, you're in the trust business, right? You, you have to, to earn right. and win and keep the trust of your clients. And if you lose that, they will go somewhere else. Not to mention, right, all the hassles associated with sort of, you know, identity theft and, and just sort of recovering the document. Um, unfortunately, you know, there's not a great, you know, what we what we tell people, though, you know, to be, you know, for companies and organizations is to really think about you know, what is your plan when it does happen? Mm. Uh, because you will have data loss, your organizations will be breached. And uh, and and some of the ideas that we put out in the book, and and then there's also at the federal level, um, there's an organization that's only five years old, six years old, called CISA, uh, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. They have a great website, um, and they will help organizations do penetration testing. They'll offer checklists, so you don't have to start from scratch that the federal government is starting to provide some of this information to help organizations. I like that. So I'm going to take one more, I, I have one more question about the IRS situation. So this guy went in there with the intent. That's why he wanted the job, 
was his yeah. intent was to go in and steal those tax returns and tell every tell everybody here's what all the rich people make here's how much tax they pay you know basically expose them he he, he basically went in with a with a snowden type of approach right i mean could they have prevented that i mean my question is is there a way to identify that that nefarious intent when we hire somebody or we bring somebody in to our organization well, you have to run, uh, yeah. you have to give them security clearances. In effect, you have to treat this information as really seriously confidential, if not more. And uh, you need to send out investigators, which is what is done for security clearances. I just recently uh, met with an investigator for who was doing a background uh, check on a former student, uh, and and I've gone through the whole process myself, as has Derek. So we know that. You can suss out intentions like that, and it must be done in an agency that can, that holds valuable information. I I, I like I that. Think, so so background checks. I I I'm not sure, frankly, that all of our listeners do background checks, and not yeah. just not just uh you know I mean we're allowed to do in in some states you're allowed to do credit checks and others you're not. That's actually a big deal when you're handling people's money and and uh, identif identifying information. Um, but some states you're not allowed to do that. And um, but you can always do a criminal background check with their with their approval. So um, what what kind of security? You know, because most of us we're not used to security clearances, things like that. We we've, we've never worked for the government. So you know, what types of things are you talking about, Derek? Yeah, so you know, it's and it's always hard because people's intent changes, and and that's really difficult. And and I'm sure the employment law varies by 50 states, uh, as you is sure to describe. You know, what I would say, at least from a cybersecurity perspective, and and again, I don't know the IRS case, I don't know the IRS system or security protocols. Um, what I hope is is what they should be then is is looking at did this individual access things that he or she should not have. Um, and, and so what organizations can do is to sort of segment or compartmentalize data. So one person does not have, and this is, I think, one of the lessons out of the Snowden case that you mentioned, is one person should not have the kings to the kingdom. Um, and you can segment that. You know, the second piece that, that John was sort of talking about is, is looking at people's online activity. If they're downloading 3,000 returns, that should have flagged something. Right, because no person should be look, working on three thousand returns at the same time, and it, and it probably because it happened, it sounds like no one was tracking that, right. and 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 that's where in some of these cases, what what uh, you know on the perimeter, you know, I, idea is, you know, organizations now can look at what activity is actually happening onside their network to say, am I going somewhere in the network or in your house that I shouldn't be going? Put locks on those places. Am I taking stuff out that I shouldn't be? Keep, you know, keep an eye on that. Um, you know, I, you know, the, the U.S. government, uh, or at least the Defense Department, I don't know if it's government wide, you know, we banned um, thumb drives probably 15 years ago. And, and I know they're still out there. Um, and, and I assume that's how these returns got out. And, and so that would be something, you know, there's some very practical small things um, you know, my my computer at my office, uh, you know, doesn't even have a USB uh, port anymore. And so we've sort of gotten rid of that and, and sort of, you know, one, you know, the movement to the cloud um, that the threat of cyber is so sophisticated. I think it's bigger than any organization can manage alone. You know, one of the things John and I were coming from really different backgrounds, really different disciplines. We don't know it all. And so, you know, there, there are organizations that, um, you know, will provide that that security and st data storage because it is such a problem. Well, so, oh. today's, no, go, go, go ahead. today's go ahead, news, there's a story about told by NSA and CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, that the Chinese government has penetrated many sectors of our critical infrastructure. And then they give in this report that summarizes, as Derek's mentioned before, what it summarizes is methods that can be taken, steps that can be taken to protect yourself. And so, as Derek has said, since the CISA is trying to provide help to uh, the uh, organizations in the United States, that you should uh, seek that help. Uh, you know, if you're uh, 
broken into, uh, you should call the FBI. The FBI needs to know what uh, organizations are being attacked, and then they can come and perhaps help you determine what kind of an attack that was. Clearly, ransomware attacks have been uh, very popular recently, and and, and th that would help them to diagnose the problem, and in some cases, they can help remediate. Or mm -hmm. if uh, funds are stolen and exchanged in Bitcoin, which people think is a, is a, is a black hole, you can't determine what transactions have occurred, that's false. We now know how to penetrate the, sec the limited security provided by uh, blockchains. So, you know, you need to turn to experts. You also need to maintain, as Derek says, good standards within your organization. You need cameras. You need uh, to record who is opening secure safes and who is uh, and how long the documents are out of the secure environment. Uh, these are all steps you can take. They're simple, straightforward, and they're effective. You know, I I, I love this. This this is some uh, some real practical. Just have cameras so so that you're recording, so people know you're recording. Because part of it's the environment, right? Part of it sure. is 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 this a secure environment or is it is it loosey goosey, right? Clearly, I mean. We all in our profession know that Iris is a little loosey goosey. Okay, so this wasn't wholly a, a big surprise to those of us in this profession, um, but that doesn't mean we have to be loosey goosey. So I love that you know you're, the the idea that computers don't even have a USB port, um, that they can only be on the cloud, and that you can put in. I presume that there are things you can put in to monitor because our biggest concern, of course, is is data privacy because. Of course, we have social security numbers, we have addresses, we have children, we have we have birth dates, we have everything on every single client in our database. And yes, it's typically in the cloud, but then we're, of course, we're dependent on them. And of course, we know, for example, a few years ago, Thomson Reuters, which is one of our big providers, had a, had a security breach. So then, you know, we can't really control that. But what I'm concerned about, how do we control what we can control? So what are some things that we can do to, to protect the data um, outside of the thumb drives, cameras, anything else that you can think of that, that we ought to be able to, we ought to be doing on a daily basis to protect the data um, on our systems? You're listening to WealthAbility for CPAs, not just because Tom Wheelwright is entertaining, but to become a better strategic tax advisor. Attorney John Scabland and his law firm, Scabland PLLC, presents with Tom Wheelwright to accountants and works with tax advisors throughout the United States, implementing strategic tax plans that protect the client's assets. Take your expertise and client value to another level by working with John. Tax professionals rave about John's approach to asset protection. John enables your client to start small and increase the complexity of their plan as their assets grow. John will custom tailor a plan that is both affordable and effective. John Scabland is your asset protection attorney who will work with your tax strategy and within your client's budget. Go to ultimateassetprotection.com and schedule a time to meet with John. Well, well I think, you know, certainly the files should be encrypted. And, and then uh, for the archival data, you know, so, you know, your financial data that's several years old that you're not going to access you know, put put that somewhere different on your network, um, and and try to you know segment between files that you need to be working on, you know, currently versus your archival data. And that way, at least if you do uh, get penetrated, you know, you might only lose a, a small amount of it. Uh, that would be one idea. But you know, John has uh, some thoughts. Right. Well, you know, when I was in the State Department, I lived in a skiff. We've all heard that term recently. It's an acronym for uh, uh, Secure Compartmentalized Information Facility. At the time I had an iPhone, I could not walk into the skiff with the iPhone. I could not take a, uh, a thumb drive or a computer into the skiff. The, uh, the State Department provided a set of drawers outside the skiffs. Every drawer had a key on it. You would deposit your electronics in that drawer and lock it and take the key. So, you know, if, and it wasn't burdensome to do that, when it comes to data itself that you want to protect, as Rob Joyce has told us, your server, your computer 
server should be maintaining a high level of security. And if you're not aware of what level of security is maintained by your cyber, your environmental provider for computer technology and communications, you should perhaps go to members of Congress and say, this is a void that needs to be addressed. Uh, help us to legislate in this area. Now, if the captains of the AI industry can uh, announce chat GPT and get everybody all worked up and then run to Congress and say, help, uh, help us, regulate us, please. What they're saying is, we don't know what to do. We've created this mess, this threat. We don't know how to resolve it. You can, that means that your profession can holler a little bit too <laughs> and insist that you could use some help, help to secure this information. At the same time, calling attention to the security vulnerabilities that exist at the IRS. I think the nation needs all of us, as we say in our book, security in cyberspace is an all of society issue. So feel feel free to, to communicate your concerns. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna follow up two, with two questions. The first is, um, a lot of offices now are virtual, so we have employees all over the country. We have, in many cases, there are offsite tax preparers that are in India. So um, that to, to me raises, so, so that physical environment we can't control. So we can't control whether they have an iPhone or not because they're in their home unless we force them to come in the office. Now we could do that. Uh, it's just really challenging in an industry that has <laughs> high demand for, I want to work from home. So as a virtual office, what kind of security can you put in there? Well, you can, what you can do is you can not outsource this work on sensitive materials outside the country. You can use Americans for that purpose. Or uh, maybe, you know, you have, you set up uh, some agreements. Have you heard of the... Uh, information sharing and, and uh, analysis centers, ISACs. Mm -hmm. uh, the financial sector was one of the first uh, sectors to create ISACs. And what they provide is a way for people in a sector that uh, to share information about vulnerabilities and, and you learn how to cope in, in this context. Uh, the, this, these were concept was introduced by the Clinton administration but it's not a government uh, organization. You can consult with the government. They'd be happy to talk to you, uh, educate you and so forth. But you know, you need some self-help here, I think. And this is a way to do it. I like that. Derek, any thoughts on the virtual office? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it's a tough one and, and sort of agree you know, with John because the old adage is there, there are two kind of companies out there, those that have been hacked and those don't, you know, that don't know they've been hacked. <laughs> um, and so that's a part of your risk profile, you know, I'm sorry to say, because, you, you know, people can walk in and just take pictures of, uh, you know, physical pictures of your screen with, with phones. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think with, you know, having centralized serve, I think monitoring activity, honestly, is maybe the only way uh -huh. to sort of get at that and, and, uh, and then doing audits, uh, on security insurance company. I mean, insurance companies have implemented cyber insurance programs, and and so given that's right a cousin of your industry you, you might take a look at you know how cyber insurance are are your companies getting cyber insurance so when those breaches important. do happen that's that's important so i i, I want to i've got one more issue i want to bring up and that's corporate transparency act because a lot of us um are you familiar with the corporate transparency act no. so this is where I'm not. All small businesses, no, not large businesses, all small businesses are required to report everything, ownership, um, social security numbers, driver's license, everything to FinCEN. Okay. And they're okay. required to do it this year. And then, th then if it's a new company, they have 90 days, next year it's going to be 30 days. Well, of course, now there's this whole new level of of cybersecurity that we're concerned about because yeah. now our clients are, you know, being required to deliver this information to a government agency, which doesn't have, has not proven to be secure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and so, so maybe the only answer to that 
on the Corporate Transparency Act is because they have a website, you do it on their website, you trust their website, and then you get insurance. I mean, is, the, is there anything else you can do there? No, I think you're right. And I, I guess I get the principle of sort of the know your customer, um, you know, know your client. Uh, no, I think it could be. And there are services out there that that are, are sort of reputational services um, that will monitor sort of the reputation of you as an individual or you, you, you your corporation, and then will take steps and, and kind of have almost like an active credit monitoring, uh, but do the okay. same thing from a cybersecurity perspective. I, I like that. Um, so, so how much, how, how much, uh, let, let's take a, a practice with, you know, 10 or 20 people in it. And some of them are remote. Some of them are, are local. Um, probably most everything's on the cloud. Um what kind of costs are we looking at to really have and, and not perfect cybersecurity? I don't think there's such a thing as perfect cybersecurity, but good, good, solid practices and good solid and, and having the monitoring stuff like that. What kind of, what kind of, what do we need to build into our, to our projections? Yeah, I don't. Um, so I don't know. So your software, I guess I would say the software that you use um, should be built with cybersecurity in it. You know, no one, no one gives Microsoft credit for being an AI company, though they are. They're a cybersecurity company, too, because how breaches happen outside the human element is, um, you know, flaws, vulnerabilities that are detected. Right. And, and so I would say sort of know your software vendor um, and, and sort of have in, you know, understand how, how secure their software is is probably the important thing. I mean, people have said, right, Apple, you know, as a as software uh, is more, you know, stronger from a cybersecurity perspective. Um, some of it, there's fewer users at Microsoft, so that might be it. But it, but it's also just about having, um, you know, trust in your software that you use. And I don't know how to put a price on that because that, you know, you're not inventing your own software. You're using right. somebody. You, you, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned about the monitoring. I, I'm, I'm very intrigued here by the idea that you can hire a company to monitor that. Um, of course, then you have their cyber risk, but, um, right. <laughs> but, but you can have actually have that monitoring service in there. Is that something that's pricey? Is it something that's, that, that a small business could, could actually reasonably do? I, well, I don't so I think know the you, answer to that, but yeah. What I on the matter of security, there are a lot of there are a couple of several different very good cybersecurity companies in the United States uh, that you can uh, identify these companies by going to uh, experts. But in addition, on the matter of insurance, uh, an idea that I like very much is that you sh an insurance a company that wants to offer you insurance should first be. Uh, do the following, investigate your environment, the environment of your provider uh, for security. Uh, just as with workers' compensation insurance, uh, what's done before a policy is issued is the insurance company comes in and looks at your environment and asks what risks are exist here for injury to your, uh, your employees. And then they ask you to remediate those issues they find they ask you to if you will provide incident data, which they will then collect anonymously and give them to actuaries, uh, and thereby try to assess the cost of various uh, 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 intrusions that occurred or data losses that occurred. Uh, that's the kind of thing that ought to be in place. There is a nascent effort to do that, but I don't think that insurance companies selling cyber insurance are actually doing that, but that's something you can request. I, I like that. That's that's great. That's that's like a free a free checkup. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I like that a lot. Um, yeah. so, uh, uh, let's wrap up with this. Uh, we're required um, in the tax world. We're required to have a WISP, a Written Information Security Plan. Um, how how would you would you even go about doing that? Um, the IRS, I understand the IRS is actually when they audit a client and they come to your office, because um, that's typically where they come, they come to the CPA's office, uh, they're actually asking for the CPA firm's WISP. So they're okay. checking up on the CPA firms that way um, when they do audits. Um, any any simple tips for coming up yeah. with that kind of a plan? Yes. If I mention information security and analysis centers, ISAC, or 
ISAO, the O being for organizations, you can join uh, or create, have created one of these organizations and share information with other CPAs. And so that you can collectively, you bring in your own experts, you can begin a bottom-up process yourselves, I think. Or you might actually find that these things are in existence. I don't know if they are for, for CPAs, but they probably are. And then you can acquire information that way. So right. turning to experts is a good thing to do. Listening to the right. government who now is offering help to companies, which is new, relatively new. Even NSA is doing that. They mm -hmm. are even helping the universities who are teaching students about cybersecurity by offering tools to them, that NSA tools awesome. that they sanitize and make available. So there's a lot of help out there that's available or coming, and you should tap it, it seems to me. I, I love it. Um, all right. Uh, Derek, any, any final thoughts or ideas for our audience here? Oh, I mean, I, it, it's certainly scary, um, you know, for sure. There is certainly a high expectation that, you know, the, the type of work that you're doing needs to be highly secure and protected, but it's a much more dangerous world out there. You know, I would say, um, you know, we, we are starting to see the first case the SEC, uh, you know, did in, um, uh, you, you know, file a criminal complaint against a cybersecurity company, Solar Winds, that's being contested in the courts. So, I mean, I would look, I, I would say it is probably important to understand, you know, from your firm's perspective, having a good plan, you know, being honest about cybersecurity, because we are seeing from a regulatory perspective, at least this SEC case and solar winds is the first one. I would expect you'll, you'll probably see more government regulation looking at how firms manage their own cybersecurity. So, you know, it, it's a new area. And if people have stayed away from it, I don't think you can do that anymore. I, I like it. And I just remind everybody out there that the IRS is checking up on you when they check up on your clients. And since we're having more and more IRS audits with the uh, big, big budget blowout that they, they received, then we can count on them asking for that uh, when they come into our office. So um, that's an, it's an interesting angle. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Derek and John. Thanks so much for being here. Um, two experts in the cybersecurity area. The book is Security in the Cyber Age and highly recommend it. Um, this, is, uh, this is a real threat to our business. Um, uh, we, <laughs> it's not just credit card information anymore. It's all of their tax information. There's so much they can do with those social security numbers and um, other personal information. Um, so uh, Derek, John, how can we find out more about uh, your work and your book? Yeah, so I think the simple uh, is go to the Google. Um, and uh, and I think if you Google uh, Google either Reveron and Savage, and, and you'll see we've done some shorter pieces. So if you don't have time for the full book, you'll, you'll see some shorter pieces out there. Of course, you've got this podcast uh, as well uh, to pick our brains. Thank you. I also have a website called New Topics in Cybersecurity that I started about five years ago, seven years ago, uh, with lots of news stories on cybersecurity classified. And, by, and I got a, a, a relatively simple way to navigate it. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, these are great resources. Uh, Derek Reveron and John Savage, thank you so much for being with us. Remember, everyone, that um, we, we do have to protect our clients' data. It's not just protecting our clients. Uh, it's also protecting us. Uh, when we um, remember, it's all about the clients first, and that creates a better practice. And when we take care of our clients and our practice, we end up with a better life. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. You've been listening to the WealthAbility for CPA show. Better clients, better practice, better life. To learn more, go to WealthAbility.com.